Welcome to our program, Exposing the Myth of American Income Inequality. Please welcome Derek Morgan, Executive Vice President of the Heritage Foundation. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Clough Center here at the Heritage Foundation. We're very happy to host this event. Uh, I do send uh, very warm greetings from Dr. Kevin Roberts, our president. He was unable to attend today because of long-standing travel plans, but he regrets not being here. He said, uh, tell Senator Graham he's a hero and a mentor. And uh, that's true for me as well. So he sends our, his very best. I know uh, you and Wendy are very involved at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And uh, he, he and, and I both thank you for your service on, with that great organization. Senator Phil Graham is the former chairman of the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee. And more importantly, the Senate was the senator from the great state of Texas, my home state. I want to say a couple of things about that. Number one, here's a man who switched parties and then decided he needed to resign his seat so that he could run under his new party label. To me, that just speaks immensely of his integrity and uh, just shows what kind of a, a person he is. A man who tells you what he thinks and a man who does what he says and a man who uh, lays it all out there for the people to decide, you know, that they'll follow. And they did. Um, you know, I, on a personal note, I got to work on Senator Graham's 1996 Senate reelection campaign. I got to cut newspaper clippings out from a physical newspaper uh, back in those days. I was so proud to work for you then, and I remain proud today. So thank you for your lifetime of integrity. Uh, all of us who worked for you can, can say that. Uh, sometimes I imagine, imagine a different world, a world where uh, Phil Graham was the nominee for president and elected in 1996. And 26 years later, I still have the sweatshirt. <laughs> And I'll tell you what, this sweatshirt is in pretty good shape. I still wear it from time to time. It's a lot like the ideas you championed. It's, stand, you know, it's, uh, it's keeping the test of time. Uh, it looks great after all these years. Uh, just think about the ideas. I'm thinking about uh, Graham-Rudman deficit reduction. I'm thinking of the Dickey flat test, which I still love to make reference to. Uh, you know, is this going to benefit the average middle-class American? Whatever this government program is or this government spending is, can you imagine how much better off we'd be if in the last 26 years we were applying the Dickey flat test? Well, the senator's latest book is The Myth of American Inequality. And this is a fresh look using all the best tools of economics to really look at a question that's, that's been around for a while and had renewed vigor from the left here just in the last uh, decade or so. In fact, my earliest memory of heritage research was some research by Robert Rector on the lives of the poor using survey data to figure out if government statistics on poverty really matched what people's lives were really like. And really, this book uh, takes that uh, work and adds in just all the best economic arguments, inflation, looking at the numbers. This book is chock full of numbers. So if you love numbers, like I know Matt Dickerson does here at Heritage, uh, you're going to love this book. So. Uh, Senator Graham is going to give remarks about his book, and then we're going to follow that with a chat uh, with our very own distinguished fellow in economics, Steve Moore. Uh, but starting off, Senator Graham, we'd love to hear, hear your thoughts. Thank you, Derek. Well, Derek, you've come a long way since cutting out uh, newspaper articles uh, in my Senate campaign. Uh, I always like to come to Heritage, and I appreciate very much you coming. Um, what I'd like to do is try to just give the basic presentation of what the book covers, and then Steve and I are going to talk, and then I can answer questions. For about 30 years, there have been real questions raised by economists as to whether our basic income number that is calculated by the Census Bureau really reflects the world we live in. And it really started with a series of studies that looked at what low-income Americans were consuming and the assets they owned and really raised the question, does this really match up with census numbers as to what the income of the bottom 20% of American earners is? In recent years, the census number has come into increasing conflict with other government statistics. 
And uh, the clear, there are two clear-cut examples. One, every year the Census Bureau gives us data on household income that is broken up into five different quintiles of income earners, uh, the bottom 20% up to the top 20%. Every year, the Bureau of Labor Statistics gives us data on consumption expenditures of the same five quintiles. For the last decade, the bottom quintile of American earners have consumed roughly twice what their income was by the Census Bureau. From 1947 to 1967, the poverty rate in America fell dramatically. And in 1967, we ramped up funding for the war on poverty. And during that war on poverty, expenditures on means-tested programs and, and other transfer payments going to the bottom 20% of income earners has grown from $9,700 per year in 1967 to, to $45,400 a year in 2017. And yet, during that period, the poverty rate is simply oscillated between 14% and 11%, depending on the state of the economy. Well, how is it possible to give the average family in the bottom 20% earners of earners $45,400 a year, and yet the poverty rate remains unchanged? Well, as it turned out, there's only one way it can happen, and that is you don't count the transfer payment. So what we do in this book is we go back to the source of our measure of household income, and we look at the assumptions census made when it started this time series in 1947, and what we basically show in the book is that the Census Bureau, in a decision in a decision in 47, in a series of decisions since, has chosen to count only one-third of all transfer payments as income to the people who have received the transfer. The Census Bureau counts only 0.9 trillion of 2.8 trillion of transfer payments as income to the people who receive the transfer. In, the Census Bureau takes no account of taxes. So in total, if you look at taxes and uncounted transfer payments, the Census Bureau does not count 40% of the gross domestic product of the United States in its measure of household income. Now, that's a pretty astounding uh, thing. Now, why does this matter? Because the household income figure is the building block of income growth measures, poverty measures, income inequality measures. And so what we find is that when you count all transfer, and let me go over what they don't count just to give you an idea. They don't count refundable tax credits where the Treasury sends you a check because they don't take taxes into account. They don't count food stamps where you get a debit card that you buy groceries with. They don't count Medicaid where the government pays for your health care. They don't count over a hundred other government programs at the federal, state, and local level where government simply pays bills. The Census Bureau tells us that the top 20% of earners in America are, have incomes that are 16.7 times the income of the bottom 20% of American earners. We show that the ratio is not 16.7, but four to one. Now, 
You can still debate whether four to one is too much or not, but it's a very different debate than when the number is 16.7 to one. We show when you count all transfer payments that the poverty rate in America is not 12%, but it's between two and 3%. Uh, we show that when you count all transfer payments as income the people that get the transfer payment and all taxes as income loss the people that pay the taxes, that whereas the census says that income inequality has grown by 22% since the Second World War, whereas Bernie Sanders says the growth in income inequality is obscene and unsustainable, and whereas the Economist magazine says it is universally acknowledged that income inequality is growing, we show in fact that it is slightly lower today than it was in 1947. So we're having a debate about fundamentally changing the American economy to deal with growing inequality when in fact income inequality is lower today than it was 70 years ago. Uh, we look at a series of other issues. Let me just touch on two, and then I'll sit down with Steve and we'll talk about the book. Uh, we talk about the super rich. Who are these people? Uh, how much money do they earn? Do they pay, quote, their fair share of taxes? We show that up to the 0.01% of earners that the tax rate average tax rate rises steadily to 40.6%. For the top 400 filers, the tax rate falls off to the mid-30s because almost all of their income comes from capital gains and because many of them give so much money away that it dramatically affects their tax rate. Uh, it is important to note also that this idea that if we simply tax the super rich, that we could have all of this government. If you took every penny they earn, you couldn't fund government for a week. If you took every penny earned by the top 1%, one out of every 100 Americans, you took 100% of their income, you couldn't fund the federal government for two months. The federal government taxes middle and upper middle income Americans for the simple reason that Willie Sutton robbed banks. That's where the money is. Um, we look at in international comparisons. The top 10% of earners in America pay a larger share of the total income tax bill, including Social Security and Medicare, than the top 10% of taxpayers in any other country on the face of the earth. The bottom 90% pay a lower share than in any other economy on the face of the earth. And finally, we look at who these people are, what do they do, and the bottom line is almost all of our discussion of inequality goes back to Plato uh, in writing about a city-state where the quantity of wealth was primarily determined by the ownership of land and where the whole competition for income was a zero-sum game. But we don't live in a zero-sum world. Uh, you can think whatever you want to think of Bill Gates, but he didn't take his money away from anybody. He created wealth. He only owned 7% of Microsoft. Who owns the other 93%? Well, most of it's owned by pension funds, and that's our money. So uh, this idea of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, the truth is the rich get richer and everybody else gets richer. If we had more rich people, we would be better off. That's a hard lesson for the left to learn, but it's true. You can think whatever you want to of Elon Musk, but every penny he's got, he made. And again, he provided goods and services. I don't particularly want some of the goods and services, but nevertheless, the people that buy them want them, and that's what we call economic freedom. We also look at 
opportunity. The left wants to make income inequality a measure of the fairness of America, but America never promised equality of outcome in the competition of life. That whole view is alien to the American ethos. What America promised, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, is a fair chance and an open way to use your enterprise and your intellect. But it never guaranteed equality of outcome. In fact, the American founders clearly uh, viewed the world the way Will Durant uh, has viewed it. Liberty and equality are sworn and eternal enemies. And where one lives, the other dies. And America has always chosen freedom rather than equality. But the question then is, what kind of mobility do we have? Final point. 93% of all Americans who grow up in bottom income quintile households end up as adults living in families that have more income than their parents. 63% of them rise to a higher income quintile than their parents. Now, this is over a 50-year period, so you need to understand that during that 50 years, because of the explosion in transfer payments, the number of prime work-age persons in the bottom quintile who actually worked fell by about 50%. So if you, when, once you drop out of the labor market, you basically stunt your economic opportunity. And so the number could even be higher if we could get people back into the labor market because that's where opportunity is. So the American dream is alive and well. Don't be put off by the graphs and charts. There's nothing complicated about the book. It is clearly written. And these are the, the we need people that believe in freedom and who want to defend freedom against all enemies, foreign and domestic, need the facts that are in this book. They arm people who want to stand up for the American economic system. The truth is that our system is not perfect, but it's wonderful. And it has served so many of us. It is so routine for ordinary people to do extraordinary things in America that we we don't even think it's extraordinary. So, Steve. Well, th thank you, Senator. Um, thank you for writing this book, and it's an incredibly important um, set of facts and a thesis. And so, um, thank you for doing this. I, I hope that this gets in universities and uh, in schools so that uh, people can learn the truth. So I, if I may, I'm going to start with the hardest question of all for you. And it's something you and I have talked about previously, which is, you know, tomorrow, for example, I have to go on Fox News, as I do every Friday morning, and debate Austin Goolsby. And Austin's a liberal, you know, Democrat. Well, he's not, you know, far left, but, you know, he, he now, what he would say if he is here, so I'm going to pay, play Austin Goolsby. All right, please. He'd say, see, I know all <laughs> he'd say, see, what Phil Graham is proving is that we can tax the rich, tax the rich, and pass out all of these welfare benefits to people, as we've been doing for the last 50 years, and we can reduce income inequality. So he would say, this is a good thing. Phil Graham is proving that the welfare state works. Now, well, I know you've been, so, no, look, I, so I please think, defend, first of all, it's a fair point. Uh, there's no doubt about the fact that you can raise the income of bottom level earners by redistributing wealth. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to remember that when Lyndon Johnson set out to declare war on poverty, his objective was not to redistribute wealth. His objective was to empower poor people to use their talent uh, and their God-given ability to advance themselves and their family. And I think the right response to Austin Goolsby is to basically point out that when all of these massive new transfers started in 1967, that 68% of prime work-age people 
in the bottom quintile worked. Mm -hmm. Today, that number is 36%. Wow. Uh, so basically, they we have dealt with abject poverty. There's no doubt about that. There, there are people that are poor in America today, 2 to 3%, but they've fallen through the cracks. The system is not reaching them and providing more food stamps and housing subsidies and 106 other programs is not going to change their problem. They have problems related to mental, severe mental illness, drug addiction, and we're going to have to reach them in another way than the poverty program. So um, the point is, if we, if we could get those people working, mm -hmm. and one of the things, the points we make in the book, this is not about the people that, that put this book together and the statistics weren't trying to make political points. We were trying to get the facts straight. But one thing that is obvious, if you're going to provide $50,000 a year to the average household in the bottom 20% of earners, uh, you're going to have to have a mandatory work requirement, as we did for aid, with fam aid to families with dependent children during the Clinton administration. So thank you for saying that, because I couldn't agree more, that that has to be uh, a central part of going forward with, with these payments is that people have to work. Um, and it seems to me, in looking at the evidence, and I, you were, you were in, still in the Senate when that welfare reform bill yeah. passed. It would seem to me involved, to, yeah. to be a huge social policy advancement when we, and that was, you know, the Republicans in the House and Senate, and to his credit, a Democratic president who oh, right. signed it after vetoing it two or three times, but he did sign it into law. And there's a lot of research that seems to suggest that it really worked, that people well, actually... I, there's a lot of hard yeah. evidence that it was the most successful right. social reform right. of my congressional career. A huge number of people that were on aid to families with dependent children took jobs, became independent, raised their uh, income, and look, so much of life and happiness is achievement of something that belongs only to you and people who love you. Uh, it's not somebody, somebody giving you stuff deals with a certain set of problems, but it doesn't provide what in the end makes people happy. Mm -hmm. And I want welfare reform not because the money it saves, that's important. And God knows that I'd like to save money in Washington, D.C., but I want welfare reform because of the, the lives of people it saves. It cannot be a good thing for people or for the country to have people sitting around all day watching television, and unfortunately many of, of uh, um, watching television and on programs like disability using drugs. Uh, so... Um, I, I think it's a reform that's needed for the well-being of the very people who will hopefully have their behavior affected. So on the other side of the income scale are the super rich, and I'm one of these people who likes super rich people. Um, but uh, the argument would be made by some of our friends on the left that we can just keep raising, if we want a more equalized income, we could just keep raising taxes on the rich. You know, we can go from, I think right now we have about a 40% tax rate. Let's go to 50 or 60 or 70. I think when Reagan came in, the top rate was 70%. Should we move back in that direction? Well, look, I, I think, first of all, before we get let liberals get carried away with that direction, we need to go back and look at the facts, which we do in this book. When the rate was 91%, when John Kennedy became president, mm -hmm. the actual taxes collected by the top 1% of earners as a percentage of their income was lower than the rate is today. In other words, we were collecting less from the top 1% when the marginal rate was 91% than we are collecting today at 37%. 
And as uh, President Kennedy wow. said in proposing reducing the rate, we're not collecting taxes, we're simply in inducing people to waste vast resources avoiding taxes. Amazing. Uh, and uh, so the effective rate was never 91%. The top rate during the war and the top rate during the Depression, uh, at the top rate during the Depression, four filers paid taxes at that rate. Wow. Uh, for all practical purposes, nobody paid those taxes. So when Bernie Sanders says, well, hell, we had prosperity in America when the tax rate was 91%, and here you're talking, complaining about 50, it's important to remind him that that tax code was so full of deductions at 91% that it collected less money uh, as a percentage of their income of the top 1% that we're collecting today. So uh, you also were there and played a big part in the 1986 Tax Reform Act, which lowered the top tax. And when Reagan came in, it was 70%. And that was lowered to 50, no, in no small part because of your work. And then a few years later, we lowered that rate to 28%. And you may recall, a lot of youngsters in this room may not remember this, but we got rid of a lot of the yeah. loopholes and special interest provisions in the code, and we got that top, I think it was two rates, 15 and 28 percent. And one of the most remarkable things about this, you may, you may not remember this, but that bill to lower the highest income tax rate to 28 percent, it passed 97 to 3. No, I States. remember. So I remember. here's my point, and I'd love your observation about this. I don't think you could get one Democrat in Congress today to vote for a 28 percent tax rate. And it's sad to me, because there was a consensus then broad base, low rate. What, do you, what happened? <laughs> well, I think the objective then, remarkably, was to have a more efficient tax right. system. We have a very inefficient right. tax system. Um, I, I used to, when I would come and talk to President Reagan about the budget during this period we were writing these budgets and the reconciliation bill, he would always say something to the effect, you know, can you imagine how good it would be in America if we really had good government? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even after our program was adopted, uh, it still, there was still so much more we could do. And what we did in 1986 is we didn't lower taxes. We simply took all the underbrush out of the right. tax code and lowered marginal rates. Right. And as a result, within two years, we were collecting more revenues right. than we were uh, at the 50% tax rate. And all of these deductions and credits distort the flow of capital, lower uh, productivity, mm -hmm. and hurt the country. Uh, so if I could snap my fingers and eliminate every deduction credit period and have, and lower the rate in a commensurate way, I don't snap my fingers very well, but I would do it. One of the people who voted for a 28% tax rate back then was Joe Biden. That's right. I was there. What I happened? I mean, I mean, in other words, if you look at what he's done in the last 22 months in all these bills they've passed, all they've done is exactly the opposite. They're adding, you know, tax credits for windmills and solar panels and burst them and this and that and the other thing. And so we're, we're now narrowing the tax base and we're raising rates. And would you agree yeah. that's the wrong thing to do? Well, I, look, I, again, I think any time government is deciding where capital flows, right. you're making a mistake. If that worked, yes. we would have torn down the Berlin Wall to get into Eastern Europe, <laughs> uh, and China would be booming today. Um, I, look, I, Joe Biden is a decent human being. And I never had, pro I, I, I didn't find it to my advantage to get into spitting contests with people. So I found something about everybody I liked. Uh, but I think Senator Biden tended to sort of go with the tide. Right. <laughs> and I think in the administration, 
that you now have the dominance of those crazies that were in the back room when Obama was president. And uh, to me, it's frightening what their agenda is. If, as I look at their regulatory policy, I don't see any objective other than the destruction of the economic system of the country. Um, other than that, their regulatory policy makes no sense. I, I like to say, Bill Clinton wanted to milk the cow, but he didn't want to do the cow any harm. Uh, Biden wanted to bruise her up a little bit. The people that are running the regulatory agencies now want to kill the cow. Now, what they want to replace it with, I'll leave that to your imagination, or whether they've even thought about it, I don't know, but Nevertheless, a frightening prospect. So uh, I'd like to ask you one more question, then we'll take a few questions from the audience, if that's okay All with right. you. Um, and this is a little bit off the subject of your book, but it's something you have more expertise on than just about anybody. And that is, uh, you know, we've seen um, $4 trillion of new spending in the last year and a half, which is more money than we spent adjusted for inflation than, than to fight World War II. So we've never seen... In my, in my lifetime, anything like this, this fiscal recklessness. And um, I'm worried as an economist about a financial crisis as a result of this massive increase in debt and spending. I, I was thinking the first time I met you, Senator, was actually here at Heritage Foundation when you came over here in, I guess it was 1986 when you did the Graham Rudman. Was that, what year was that? 86, yeah. 85. And that was quite a accomplishment. You know, we put in uh, some guardrails on spending, and, and actually spending did come down for a few years until yeah. Congress abandoned it. Um, how worried are you about where we are financially in this country? Am I, am I being too dour? I, we can't continue no, look, to I don't follow think like so. this. I, first of all, I wrote Graham Rudman because I couldn't get anybody to take spending seriously. Right. Um, and... Uh, I, I figured out that the only way to do it was to put some binding constraints. But where we are now is, first of all, there's never been a surge in spending in the modern era that in any way rivals what has happened in government in the last three years. And the spending has not stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the uh, this so-called deficit reduction bill, that none of the tax increases go into effect until after the presidential election, but all the spending goes into effect immediately. The infrastructure bill is totally a spending bill, mm -hmm. and we're going to, to subsidize the building of computer chips when we may be using computer chips for landfill in two years right. because the massive overinvestment, right. every company that makes them is losing money. A lot of those are in Texas. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, um, my concern twofold, one, that if we're forced to deal with the inflation with monetary policy alone, right. we're going to end up choking the economy because the only way you remember the way monetary policy brings down inflation is choking off private demand right. to allow the public demand to not drive up prices. Mm -hmm. So if you've got to drive down private spending at anything like the amount that public spending has gone up, you're talking about gut-wrenching kind of increases. And I think secondly, you know, we're, uh, if you look at the current services baseline now, the, the spending that is built in permanently has dramatically increased. Mm -hmm. And when Republicans uh, it, have a majority, which I believe they will, in both houses of Congress after the election, uh, they're going to have, they're going to be launching the Republican ship uh, in, a, in hurricane winds, and it's a leaky boat. Mm. I mean, they're going to have to make some very tough decisions. If we simply ratify this spending level, uh, then uh, we're going to end up with, we've got a tax increase coming in two years. A bra we don't have old-fashioned bracket creep, 
But don't forget the capital gains on the inflation, uh, the inflation on capital gains is taxed. Uh, there are dozens of other provisions like Social Security is taxed above an income level that is not indexed. So government revenues are rising very rapidly because of inflation. Right. Government is the only beneficiary <laughs> right. of inflation. Exactly. All right, well, well put. So uh, none of these things represent good news for the working people in this country. So we have time for two or three questions, I guess. So uh, please uh, identify yourself and uh, and keep them as brief as you can because we're running a little bit I'm on time. Brendan O'Connell, and I'm a, a lawyer in Florida. Um, I like you want to see people working. We're having a hard time hearing you. I'm old and I'm dead. <laughs> people have yelled but, at me. But what I run into is uh, I see a woman working and. Uh, She's doing a good job, but she's got two kids, and she's paying 200 per kid a week to mind her children. Now, some people are dropping out of the workforce because of that high price. I, I am pleased to see that Senator Romney and the president both said, maybe we should subsidize these children, because we got a low birth rate, we're not replacing ourselves. 300 a month may be okay per kid to live 17. That was the proposal. It died. But we, we've got that problem of demography and the problem of being able to support child care. What do you think we can do with that? Well, I, I would prefer to deal with the problem by lowering taxes and letting people deal with their own uh, child care, letting them make their own decisions. Um, government subsidies are so inefficient uh, that I don't think it's the right way to do it. Um, and again, if you create a booming economy by letting uh, the basic talents of ordinary people uh, reach fulfillment in the economy. I think you create a kind of optimism about the future that induces people to want to be part of it through their children. Um, I had a, I have a sister-in-law who was a mathematician with Hughes Aircraft, and I remember her saying, well, I don't know why y'all are having these children because the, salt, the sea is getting saltier and, you know, we're going to have all these problems. And I said, well, who the hell is going to solve those problems? Our <laughs> children are going to solve those problems. We're doing a public service by having these children. Now, they had not solved those problems yet, but nevertheless. <laughs> uh, so I think the way to do it is Get government, let government do what only government can do, and let families do what families do best. Okay, next question. My name is Melanie Sturm. I'm from Colorado. And we were talking about income inequality. Thanks to the Fed, thanks to the quasi economic theory of monetary theory, we probably have an explosion of wealth inequality. Uh, really since the Great Recession of 2008 because of the interest rates being so low. So all asset classes have exploded in value. People who don't have assets, just little bank accounts, have earned virtually nothing. So we have a, a great distance between those who are poor and those who are wealthy. And sort of to push back on something you said, Steve, you like the wealthy, but th they're the very people, the coastal elites, who are funding a lot of the legislation and the bad policies that are causing the problems that we have in the economy. Um, well, so respond. how would you how would you address that? Yeah, well first of all, I would I would make a few points. 75 million Americans have in investment in the in equity markets. Uh, most of corporate America belongs to pension funds, mm -hmm. annuities, life insurance policies. And so the run-up in equity markets has benefited 75 million American households. Secondly, I think 
in measuring wealth inequality, you got to take some account of the wealth that people have in government benefits. I mean, uh, if, if a pension fund I have is valuable to me, it may go down in value tomorrow, but if you've got Social Security benefits coming, the odds are you're going to get those, and the odds are probably higher that I'm going to get the benefit of my pension fund. So uh, how valuable is my Medicare benefit? Uh, I only do Part A, so it's not very valuable, but that's a decision I've made. So I think when you take all those factors into account, it's a very different story. I mean, you see all these statistics out there about it's, these people own 50% of the wealth, but look, it's not taking into account any of the things that I've talked about. Why did we use income rather than wealth? Because there are no good measures of wealth. And most long-term projections like Piketty and others use, they use income as a way of estimating wealth. And so they're highly correlated, and so we just stuck with what we could measure. So look, would it be better if more people were better off? Yes. Uh, but the point is that the way to make them better off is not with more government transfer payments. It's with a stronger, more vibrant economy, I would argue. And, uh, you know, the world is not totally fair. If you get a choice, uh, be born brilliant and beautiful and rich. <laughs> but being born ordinary uh, and plain and poor is not a disqualification in America. People that are ordinary and plain and poor or grow up that way succeed in America every day uh, and do so at extraordinary rates. Senator, you're just saying that's because you're so beautiful, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I think we have one more question over here. Uh, uh, the... Uh, and then, okay, we'll get we'll two more. We got to make these quick, though. Yeah, sure. It is quick. Uh, Bill Walters in College Park. Steve sent around a note yesterday telling us that Washington D.C. is a wash in homeless. Do those people figure in your statistics? Yeah. Look, they're the two to three percent that you see in Washington. You see in Austin. You see in San Francisco, and these are people that. They, they haven't applied for food stamps. They haven't applied for rent subsidies. Uh, they have fallen through the cracks. Many of them have significant mental problems, and they're not being reached by these programs. And uh, uh, if we want to deal with them, we cannot do it by simply spending more money on these general programs. We have got to have some old-fashioned programs where somebody goes out and figures out what their problem is and tries to help them. Um, all, right, all right. Well, we have reached our uh, time limit. Um, let's this lady. All right. right. Well, let us, sorry. We, Go ahead. I'm Barbara Follow up on your leaky boat analogy. Is it isn't just that there's some holes in the boat poked in there by people who made stupid policy decisions, but there's a lot of heavy stuff in the boat that has to do with their decisions to spend too much money. What can a new Congress do to get rid of that excess cargo that we need to get rid of? What Reagan did in 1981, yeah. cut spending. Yeah. Uh, look, we just had the government spend as much in two years as it normally spends in three years. There is money, uh, money, the state and local government, the federal government, all wash in money. Yeah. Uh, we need to pull some of that money back. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to reduce government spending. And look, Republican priorities, we want to increase defense. Uh, we would like to make the tax cuts permanent. Uh, they're going to expire the last day of 2025. 
We're not going to be able to do any of those things if we cannot bring spending under control. Look what happened in Britain. You know, people want to say, well, the prime minister in Britain tried to do what Reagan tried to do. She didn't. Reagan had a dramatic budget program to reduce spending, and everybody, because of the way the story is told, remember that Reagan cut taxes, but they don't remember that Reagan cut spending. As a percentage of GDP, government was 1% smaller the day Ronald Reagan left Washington than the day he came. Non-defense spending was 1.5% as a percentage of GDP lower. Defense was a half a percent bigger. Um, and the reason that her program produced a financial panic, besides people who wanted it to, uh, is that she, everything she proposed was either cutting taxes or increasing spending. She had no program whatsoever to do with the fact that spending has already exploded in Britain. Inflation's over 9%. Um, uh, so comparing it to Reagan is a bad comparison. All right, um, Senator, uh, thank you very much. This is a really important book. I hope Buy the book it. and read it. It's called you The, the, no, uh, the American say. Income and Equality. Well, and actually, we have copies of the book outside for our in-person audience, and I think you've said you'd been, be willing to we sign some of sign, those books. Yes. Um, as long so. as there's no check attached. <laughs> <laughs> I, for one, am going to keep my sweatshirt just in case. <laughs> oh. Just in case. And uh, I want to thank you all. collector's item. There were few of those ever purchase. That's right. So I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you to our online audience. And let's thank our, our Senator Phil Graham and Steve Moore. Thank you, Senator.